Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about swimming in the microservices ocean. So we layered the monolith, and now we try to see how to scale it. Um, so I work for Nearform, like many of other people here. And uh, you can find me on the internet with my name and surname. That's my handle everywhere. And um, if I'm not actually traveling the world on an airplane, I'm just spending some of my time working on the post-mortem working group. Um, so if you check my talk of last year, uh, last year I was digging my hands inside of uh, core dumps. And then I just uh, saw the light and I moved into distributed architecture. So like everybody working with uh, big architectures, I do have a dream. And uh, this dream is just to build something that is resilient and scalable and with almost no maintenance. It's actually my dream also at home to have a Roomba or something that can clean my house. But for now, I still didn't achieve this goal yet. Um, so I like actually to tell stories more than uh, to make demo or anything. I always have bad experience uh, coding on stage. So once upon a time, that's how every fable and story starts, there was the monolith. And uh, uh, the monolith had different kind of shapes. And if you actually go on Google, it's actually pretty funny that if you go on Google Images, one of the first hits that you get is actually this picture. That is considered a monolith. So I, I consider it actually the, I call it as a joke, the Java monolith. And I, I, I didn't dare to put the two keys together on Google and see. But I, I bet with a little bit of uh, money on Google Ads, I can get it <laughs> as a first hit. But uh, um, we all know that actually this, uh, um, the monolith actually had its own disadvantages. So it was definitely not something that uh, could scale with a high demand uh, uh, of nowadays internet, right? Everybody has a mobile phone, and we all know actually what the iPhone and the Android introduce into APIs market. So um, because I, before studying uh, engineering and nuclear physics, I studied at the gymnasium, I studied a little bit of uh, you know, uh, Latin history. And as you can hear from my accent, yeah, I'm Italian. So actually, uh, Philip of Macedonia uh, introduced this kind of incredible, st incredible strong concept in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, war strategy that is divide et impera. It means that if you segregate, if you make your things as simple as possible, you can just conquer the world. Well, it, it did in a certain case. But, um, so that's actually what the story from uh, uh, the monolith, uh, we move into an next phase that are microservices. And you know we have some gurus of microservices down here. But we also all know that microservices so became something trendy and hipster. And uh, you know, this guy has a beard, he's pretty hipster. So and uh, um, one of the concept, key concepts introduced by microservices was definitely the uh, stateless nature of microservices. And uh, um, one thing that usually um, uh, we, one thing that we're really acquainted with is basically something like this diagram, where basically we have a proxy layer that is most of the time a layer 7 appliance um, connected with multiple uh, microservices. But they all actually connect to a single source of truth, that is uh, the data storage. So, And we know that actually once that you introduce a single point of failure that can be your data, you lose actually your resiliency because your state is going to be any, anyhow centralized in one single point. And another actually downfall of microservices is definitely uh, service discovery, right? It's an L. Um, there are different strategies, different ways of running service discovery, right? There's DNS or there's another thing that is the magic console or etcd. How many of you are running console, by the way, in their microservice application? OK. etcd? OK. Well, I don't like either of the two. I really don't like them. They are pretty big. Uh, that's actually their main problem. And uh, um, one of, the, one of the, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main key that they still leave open in distributed architecture is the concept of coordination. So OK, you tell me where I can reroute my request, but there is no way that I can coordinate this request, that I can coordinate all my requests uh, to my microservices. Also because the problem of balancing is still a question, even with service discovery, right? Uh, Consult doesn't know anything about my, my microservice unless I don't tell him. 
And uh, um, like we said before, actually, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems of introducing uh, mobile client was actually that the insane growth of success of uh, mobile APIs. And actually, this problem was before solved in a very traditional way. Um, how many of you know what this picture is? Uh, it's basically for the other 99.99% of people that didn't raise their hand is the Google, uh, one of the Google data center. Uh, I tried to look for the one of Amazon, but clearly I didn't get any image. Um, and actually, that's when we start to scale horizontally, right? We have high demand, high throughput, and we scale horizontally our machine. But once again, one of the, the biggest problems of this model still remains uh, the uh, coordination and especially the distribution of our load. So we moved from physical data center, and we got the answer that was the cloud. AWS is the most famous, right? I just to keep stuff equal, I put uh, one picture of Google and one of Amazon, so I keep both of them very happy. Um, and one of the solutions that actually uh, we see in, uh, in AWS to scale and to basically solve this problem of coordination and distribution is basically the, what I call the magical combination of um, the auto-scaling group uh, and the elastic load balancer. Well, if you check any of my other talks, you know that I have a very strong opinion about how stupid is the elastic load balancer. And more recently, Amazon introduced the application load balancer, another masterpiece of uh, stuff that they don't work. Um, but actually, this one didn't solve the problem at all, right? Uh, we still scale horizontally, and we don't utilize our vertical resource of our machines. In this path of growth, uh, there was a new disruptor that changed a little bit the world with distribute uh, uh, Node.js application. And this one was the world of container that we saw before with uh, uh, the cruise ship of Costa. And uh, um, this model actually... Um, became extremely uh, developer friendly, like everybody knows, with Docker. But once again, this one is how usually you deploy on a container uh, environment. This one is, uh, um, is the architecture of uh, deployment of Vacamp, if anybody knows, uh, is an e-commerce website. Uh, and they use actually um, a combination of Marathon and Mesos to distribute a container in their infrastructure. But still, the question is always, how do we make it fault tolerant uh, and resilient? Well, in all these models, the only way that we can make failure detection is still through heartbeat. So we have a system that heartbeat all the machine and says, are you still alive? Are you still alive? Are you still alive? And uh, this, this model clearly works, um, but it's not ideal. It doesn't massively scale. So what it leaves still open is that uh, even, if I, um, even if I know when a machine is basically up or down, the state of the cluster might change all the time and continues. It might not be updated in every single node of my cluster. So, and that's where swimming enters in place. So, um, this, uh, uh, some bright student from Cornwall University came out with this uh, white paper that, uh, how many of you know what Swim is? Okay, now I'm gonna make somebody mad. How many of you are downloading? No, I, I ask you later this thing. So maybe the people are leaving and they don't uh, kill me for the question. But uh, Swim is actually a um, um, gossip protocol. Um, and is acronym stays for Scalable Weekly Consistent Infection Style Membership Protocol. So, I, it's actually pretty funny that I could find a word with a meaning uh, that is an acronym of a protocol. So um, this actually a uh, few words, they hide uh, a uh, very powerful way of basically distributing the, sta distributing the state uh, across the cluster. Um, we are all living in a weekly consistent world, right? Um, how many of you have a bank account? I hope everybody. Okay. Um, so do you know that actually your bank uh, system is not strong, strongly consistent? Strongly consistent means that in the moment that you process a transaction, the state of this transaction is propagated and consistent across all the state of this transaction. So if you, for example, make, uh, if, you, um, if you wire some money to me, uh, please do it so we can verify if it really works. Um, 
you can you can easily see that the money they are removed from your bank account and they are added to my bank account. But in between, in all these transaction state, uh, uh, they don't guarantee that the money are really transferred exactly in this moment uh, from A to B. So the, tr the transfer from A to B is not strongly consistent, Can, but is actually weakly consistent, which guarantee much more flexibility and speed. And it's a risk actually that nowadays traditional transactional system they can, uh, can take. And uh, um, the interesting point is that actually it allows a very simple failure detection over the entire cluster. Because we are gossiping all to each other, the state is continuously re uh, moved around the entire cluster. So if I'm faulty, I have, uh, I'm detected by other two nodes that I'm faulty, and my state is propagated to everybody else. It's a little bit like in Italy, we have this kind of concept of the, of the lady that uh, keeps, takes care of our basically building where apartments are. And uh, one of the things that actually, uh, it's, a, it's a common way of saying in Italy, that if you, tell, if you tell her something, all your neighbor will know this thing. And that's actually the same model as WIM, right? You tell to one of the nodes something, and everybody else will know about it. Um, and that's where actually the, the, the real power of uh, uh, information dissemination comes in place, right? The information is moving all the time across your cluster. So it's never statically pointing to one single place. Uh, imagine that if you set uh, some kind of configuration or some kind of uh, information in a database, a single point of failure, while now the entire cluster is uh, uh, n number of point of failures uh, distributed in this case. And uh, the interesting thing is that you can really play with uh, some interesting uh, load balancing algorithm on the cluster, because clearly if you can distribute the state to every node, every time that you ask to the node the state of the entire cluster, it knows it real time. And the nicest thing is that it's really born for highly distributed system. It sounds all magic, this thing. But truth has to be told that every time that you add a node to the cluster, how can I rebalance the entire topology? Clearly, imagine I add a node to the cluster, and I need to rebalance the entire state topology. Well, uh, especially I need to redistribute the state and all this kind of complexity. So that's where. Magic happens at the intersection, they say. So that's when the consistent hash ring meets swim, then you can get a highly fault tolerant state distribute cluster. So how many of you know what consistent hash ring is? At least one person, two, well, few, few people. Um, well, if, is it basically one of the main concepts behind also peer-to-peer -peer connection. So if you are, for example, downloading from uh, uh, BitTorrent, um, just to make a very concrete example, that's uh, easily how uh, information are distributed and uh, shared across the entire network. Just to make it very simple, it's not really accurate, but just to give you an idea. Imagine that the information is basically sharded and partitioned across the entire network. How many of you are familiar with Oracle databases? I know that I should not mention this name. I will burn in hell for that. So um, actually, uh, it's pretty interesting because Oracle is, uh, was the first database to implement a real state partitioning, uh, which is basically a kind of hash ring, is a shard inside of the database itself. Really powerful, pretty expensive. Um, the nicest thing is, well, like I just said, is that uh, we are just applying the same concept of database sharding, of data sharding, to the entire cluster and information sharding. And this one allows us to basically have a very highly predictable um, elasticity, because we know exactly how to scale or downscale the cluster and the information. The interesting thing, like I just said before, is that the state is completely distributed. And that's an, an enormous advantage, because you, you move from having stateless application to fully stateful application, that they are extremely volatile. So I can add a new node, and the state is automatically rebalanced uh, inside of the entire cluster. Um, Anybody knows the symbol? Because I didn't put the, what it is. It's Surf, it's from Ashicorp, and they implement basically a swim and consistent hashing implementation. So if you're using Consul, Consul is based on Surf. And basically what I just said is happening also in a cluster of uh, uh, Consul machines. Actually, uh, Cassandra used the same uh, mechanism to distribute uh, his data and uh, DynamoDB. So, but, uh, so how many of you are working for Uber? 
Yeah, I hope nobody. So I don't tell. I tell something new. So Uber actually had the same problem for their dispatch uh, system. So how many of you are using Uber? One, one person, two, three. OK, a few people. So when you open Uber and you ask uh, for a cab to come and pick you up to your address, you are hitting a Node.js application that is called the Dispatch API. The Dispatch API is completely based on Ring Pop. And Ring Pop is basically their application level sharding uh, library to basically allow um, extremely fast uh, um, dispatch information. Um, on the other end of, uh, on the other side of the ocean, uh, somebody that you might have seen a few times on the stage, uh, Matteo, also wrote uh, a library called Upring uh, that does exactly the, the same thing, but with a big, enormous advantage. That we finally know how it works because it's much simpler. So Ringpop is an extremely big library, and almost nobody knows how it really works. While Upring is extremely tiny, and uh, the big advantage is that uh, it's extremely simple and almost brain dead to implement an application-level sharding Node.js application. So, but uh, um, what uh, uh, our our best friend uh, of Uber did, they actually needed to uh, distribute uh, in an extremely eventually consistent world, that is the world of taxis that are moving around the globe. And uh, um, just, just to emphasize what they try to do with Ring Pop, this one is actually what application level sharding means. It means that the application itself is responsible of the sharding information. So the application itself knows where that shard is located in the cluster, which is extremely powerful because, uh, uh, like I said before, the rebalance can be done in nanoseconds. In order to do all this thing, um, Uber had to introduce something. Uh, so I'm using Uber as an example because they have something in production live and running and everybody's using, almost everybody. Um, I, they, they, they basically had to put an overlay network because clearly what is missing to all this picture is uh, all the routing uh, and network logic uh, uh, piece. So they build Hyperbahn, but Hyperbahn, unfortunately, is something that nobody knows how it works. So it's, uh, we call it the fourth mystery of Fatima, because nobody really knows how it works. Um, but the interesting part is that uh, the combination of between ring pop, so an application level sharding, and Hyperbahn solve completely the problem of uh, service discovery. That's the, the only important thing to notice. And, uh, in order to speed up uh, the information dissemination and to basically embed the traceability in all this world, they actually uh, create uh, uh, their own protocol. is um, a TCP protocol called T-Channel and allows basically to call uh, uh, services through RPC. Do you know what RPC is, right? So we go back 20 years and uh, that's the world of RPC. But actually, the interesting part, if you read what uh, Matt Sweeney said about uh, um, uh, T-Channel, is that uh, um, it can easily handle out-of-order responses, because that's one of the problems of distributed uh, communication, is that the order of the responses is not guaranteed. And what T-Channel can do, it can recompose back all the order of responses in a agglomerated response, which is extremely interesting. And to make clear, this one is a picture to show what happens usually in a TCP communication. There are a lot of cars, there's almost no distribution, there's no uh, coordination. And T-Channel actually tried to bound all these points uh, together into a single uh, response. Um, but we mentioned something very important that maybe a few of you are acquainted with in microservice architecture is actually traceability. So what was a priority for uh, such a large-scale distributed system was traceability of the request. And uh, um, if you actually go one level deeper, for them was extremely important because every transaction, it's a, a financial transaction. So by law, needs to be audited. And actually, T-Channel uh, is an implementation of a protocol called uh, Dapper, uh, created by Google. Uh, how many of you are know what Dapper is? One, one person. Yeah. One person makes me up. So Dapper is basically um, just a system tracing uh, uh, protocol. And uh, I highly recommend you if you are running microservices or distributed architecture to take down only one name of all the things that I said, that is actually Zipkin. Uh, Zipkin is uh, the tracing library written by Twitter for tracing their entire microservices. It's an insanely smart library. Um, 
it has a complete uh, uh, um, tracing system behind the scene, so you can uh, uh, basically visualize exactly how the requests are going through all your infrastructure and uh, service uh, architecture. But the question is why Uber went for uh, RPC, and I think it's a very smart uh, decision that I completely agree with. So we go back 20 years, at least. I was very young. And uh, um, the idea is that uh, we have now a strongly, so we have a weekly consistent cluster where the inform information is, ex is extremely flat, right? Because every single service owns a piece of its own information and the entire cluster information. And the nicest thing is that we are just calling function inside of this cluster. Um, and Hyperban actually acts as a kind of uh, TCP router for all these kind of function calls. And uh, uh, we mentioned actually our best friend from uh, AWS. So AWS has also their own implementation, that is Lambda. Um, how many of you are running Lambda? Anybody? Okay, well, one of the problems of Lambda is that I can still cannot run it completely offline. So that's one of the questions still how they're gonna solve. But the we saw that we move from monolith to microservices to distributed architecture, and the last step and phase of this uh, long, la long uh, living life of uh, uh, services is the serverless world. That is the, what Lambda introduced. And uh, just to conclude this uh, talk about high scalable distributed architecture, I think actually that uh, this distributed function processing is just the new hipster coming. Uh, we see many companies moving into that direction. But I think actually the most important thing is that um, if we think about instead of distribu distributing uh, um, network, uh, basically network application like web services, but we think how to distribute function, we actually have a very simple development and scalable model that is going to be very easy to maintain, uh, especially very easy to develop. And uh, um, I think that's actually the future where um, this large-scale architecture they are ending to. I don't know if they will end or will stop, but that's definitely the direction. And uh, that was my small talk about uh, swimming in uh, the microservices architecture. Thank you. It's in Italian.